excited to introduce um, Gigi and Katie from the Denver Public Library, and they are going to um, walk us through um, evaluating beginning readers. So I'm going to turn it over to you, ladies. Thanks, Christine. All right. Yeah, thank you, Christine. Okay. Oh. I think. Awesome. All right. So welcome, everybody, to Level It Up, Evaluating Beginning Readers. I'm Katie, and as Christine said, I'll be presenting with Gigi today, and we are so happy to have all of you here from not just Colorado, but all over. It's, uh, it's really exciting. So as we mentioned, we are going to learn today how to evaluate uh, beginning readers and children's books in your collection. So Hopefully, uh, by the end of this, you'll feel confident enough to come away being able to explain access issues related to beginning readers and leveling, understand some of the details of the beginning reader collection criteria that we've come up with, and then the classification rubric used for evaluating books in the beginning reader collections by level, and finally, gain experience using these tools to evaluate beginning readers yourself. That's the most important part, right? Uh, so just a little bit about me. I am a librarian in the Denver Public Library System, and I work at one of our branches, the Hadley Branch Library, for those of you who are local and might know it. Um, one of the nice things about being a branch librarian is I get to do a little bit of everything, which is great. Um, but I found I particularly love um, evaluating these beginning readers and doing other work with um, early learning. Um, I find that really rewarding. Thanks, Katie. I'm Gigi Payarulo. I am a children's librarian, and I work downtown at the Central Children's Library. And um, I'm part of the grade level reading team, which is how a lot of this work uh, came to me. And I'm really excited to share it with you today. Let's get to it. All right. So in a little bit, Gigi is going to give kind of an overview of beginning readers and how the project got started. But before we do that, uh, we wanted to hear from you. What issues have you all experienced with uh, those beginning reader levels or leveling systems? Um, go ahead and share your experiences in the chat, because I know we have a uh, our own experience, but we'd love to hear from other libraries or library systems as well. Yes, it was our issues with levels typing. and yeah, our issues with levels and leveling systems. That is why we are here today to share our experience yeah. with you. Oh yeah, we've and got Christy and yep. yeah, definitely levels not being the same from publisher to publisher. Yeah, it's difficult to direct uh, patrons to the correct books. Oh, yes, Michelle, there's a lot of different leveling systems, and it all depends on the schools, too. Yep, publishers leveling books differently, for sure. Sharon and Danielle, we'll talk a lot about that today. Yeah, and Gloria, like you said, sometimes those books don't even have the levels on them, so it's hard to evaluate when you don't even have a baseline. I'm glad to see there's uh, so many folks who are passionate about this. That bodes well for the rest of our presentation. Mm -hmm. Emergent readers overlapping with early readers, right, those paperbacks versus those hardbacks and how to kind of make that distinction. Um, yeah, kids and their grown-ups being really stuck on one level or whatever, whatever level they think or they've been told or they've discovered is their level. Yeah, that is. We're going to address a little bit of that, too, through our um, criteria. Just spend okay. another minute or two. Yep. And shelving. Oh, yes, yeah. Due to the physical format of the books. Yep. We uh, can feel you on all of these issues. These are all things that we experienced and all led to um, this work. Uh, 
a couple more folks typing and then we'll move on after that. Oh, yep, getting stuck on a level so free choice is lost, especially if the school is assigning things. Yep, patrons asking for levels that the schools use, but they are not consistent with how they're leveled or shelved at the library. Um, yeah, these are all, you know, these are all really great points. Thank you all for sharing them. Um, so as you can see, there's a, definitely a lot of inconsistency and some unique challenges that come with beginning readers. Um, so Gigi is going to go ahead and launch us into, you know, why does this matter? Why does this project matter? Thank you, Katie. You're welcome. So yeah, grade level reading at the Denver Public Library, um, a part of a team um, that was started a couple of years ago. And for the grade level reading project team, uh, this heat map that you see here from the status of Denver's Children's Report has been our constant companion. Um, on this map, you'll see the darker shade of orange. The darker the shade of orange, the more students there are um, that are in the neighborhood that are not reading at grade level. And according to a recent Chalkbeat article, just 26 out of 178 uh, districts throughout the state of Colorado have more than half of their third graders reading at grade level. Um, in other words, in Colorado, 40% of third graders read at grade level, so that's 60% who don't. Um, in Denver, that number is a little lower at 39.4. Um, so just some st statistics to kind of give you a background of um, what's going on in our city and state as far as grade level reading. and. Um, we know the ability to read is a foundation students need in order to navigate future grades and their life after school. Um, and the Denver Office of Children's Affairs states that beginning in fourth grade, children transition from learning how to read to reading to learn. So there's an issue here. Um, and in response to this, uh, we put together an internal work team at DPL to look at what our role could be in supporting developing readers and their families. Um, at the public library, it's not necessarily our MO to limit children uh, or our collection by reading level, right? Um, that's kind of something that we see happening maybe in schools, but that's something that we tend to kind of strive to not do. So what's that mean for us to support this kind of grade level reading work? Well, we started out with this project mission for our team to support and empower library staff, families, and educators to connect children kindergarten through third grade with diverse books they enjoy and that inspire curiosity to foster lifelong readers. Um, we came up with this after a lot of research and discussion and also because in our meetings with Denver Public Schools, we heard a clearly articulated need for us at DPL to focus on the joy of reading really rather than the adults of learning to read, which made sense to us because library employees aren't trained to teach people to read, right? That's not our job. We're trained to connect readers with materials that match their interests and their reading levels and things that they love and, thing, and materials and books that inspire children to love reading and to um, continue with that process, which we know is often pretty difficult um, and can you know, contain a lot of struggles of its own. Um, so one way that we connect readers to materials is creating as many access points as possible for customers and staff alike, right? That's something that was brought up um, in the chat is that it's hard to find uh, beginning readers sometimes or hard to find books that are at the correct level unless they're labeled a certain way or cataloged a certain way. So this is how we first began thinking about the criteria for books for developing readers. And we decided to come up with a couple of subject headings, early and transitional book subject headings. We asked, how can we make it easier for caregivers and DPL staff to find excellent diverse books for readers in kindergarten through third grade? And this was one of our important efforts. Early and transitional book subject headings um, that are local subject heading points, which means we created them in-house. They weren't created by a vendor or given to us by the Library of Congress. 
Um, we landed on subject headings as a way to provide more access points for customers and staff, um, but without shelving changes or stickers or any kind of stigma for customers or children who might be um, reading at levels uh, that are different than their grade level expectation, et cetera, et cetera. So these subject headings are also searchable via our online public access catalog or our staff site interface, which we use Polaris, if you're curious. Um, and yes, we did create two subject headings. You can see there are early books and transitional books. Those early books are those very, very beginning, uh, beginning books that support kids just starting on that journey. And then the transitional books are those that bridge uh, from early to chapter books. Uh, we considered a bunch of terms but we landed on these two. And we have criteria for each subject heading that covers supportive elements such as design, font, vocabulary, as well as uh, the importance of the inclusion of titles with diverse representations. So these subject headings are helpful, but at the same time, only if the books within each section make sense, right? It's not helpful if a level two book is labeled an early book, but it's really more of a transitional book. Um, so that also informs the work that we'll be talking about um, in this seminar with leveling the book. So let's take a look at some of the early book criteria. Part of our work um, putting together criteria, part of our work was putting together criteria for each of the subject headings and we based a lot of it on KT Horning's book from cover to cover as well as the Geisel Award criteria. Uh, we want the criteria to be detailed enough to help us determine if a book was a good fit, but we also needed there to be some wiggle room for informed judgment. So for instance, our criteria for early books includes a Lexile range of 0 to 350. Uh, we found that's usually right about on target. Sometimes the title doesn't have a Lexile level, though, or it fits with all the other criteria except the Lexile level. So then we'll kind of use our own informed judgment as librarians to decide what to do. Um, in the case of this example with the Raccoon Cubs book, it's pretty clearly on target. It has a Lexile level of 110. And then if you look at some of those other criteria uh, we've called out, we look for a large font, ample white space between words and around the text, and this helps the eye focus because we have to train our eye muscles to read. And also the white space doesn't have to be white. It could be blue or green. It, it, important thing is that it provides an uncluttered background to make the words stand out. So let's take a look at another early book page. Um, this is from You Are Not Small by Anna Kang. And we look for sentences made up of no more than one to 12 short words that are you know, one or two syllables a piece. And it's best if these words repeat often so that readers have a chance to practice and gain confidence with them. Confidence with them. And we're also looking for simple punctuation uh, for a very important element for new readers that the punctuation not be too complex. Things like colons, semicolons, ellipses really can be confusing for these book earliest of readers. We also want illustrations on every page with, and every two page spread with early books and that help readers by supporting the text. So in this example, we have visual representation, representations of you and I and big and small. Um, and so also we want the illustrations to be representative enough of the text that they're enticing, that they promote reading motivation. Um, so, but they also, there's a fine line between them telling the story so much that kids are not reading. So that's a separate issue. We're not going to necessarily address that so much in this presentation, but representative of the text. Um, in case you're wondering, this book does have a Lexile level of 60. Um, and in this next section, we'll talk more about specific, more specific criteria. Here are a few more early book examples. Excellent early books that we're calling out. Um, title and author information are included in the notes for these slides. And you can see that there's nonfiction, graphic novels, picture books, and more traditional beginning reader, but that I like the farm book. Moving on to transitional books and the criteria for those books. Uh, as you might expect, the criteria uh, allows for longer books with more text. In general, we're looking for books that are no longer than 48 to 100 pages, although nonfiction titles are generally much shorter uh, than nonfiction titles that are a transitional level. The font should still be large, though it doesn't need to be as large as the font we see in the early books, right? It's getting a little bit smaller, but still should be big enough to be supportive. We want 
wide margin still and white space, but we can see in this example, it doesn't have to be as plentiful as an early book. Uh, the reader's eyes are getting, um, eye muscles are getting stronger. They're getting used to longer sentences and, and working harder. Here is the next transitional book, Charlie and Mouse. Um, like so was, we're looking at titles around 350 to 750. That previous example, Fox and Chick, was at 370. Um, at this slide, Charlie and Mouse is 420. Um, we also found that um, not all transitional books do have chapters, but it's helpful to have a ballpark number of pages per chapter for those that do. For the for context here, um, chapters in Charlie and Mouse are between 6 and 12 pages, this one that we're looking at now. And then in that prior book, Fox and Chick has, a lo has longer chapters, about 15 to 16 pages, which also makes sense because it's a graphic novel. This is more of a traditional fiction. Um, and finally, we still want illustrations that are represent representative of the text to keep readers engaged, but they don't need to be on every page, as they did with early books. So here are a few more examples. Um, again, you can see we have beginning readers, early chapter books, graphic novels, and some nonfiction as well. So I'm going to move this slide to our next chat, yeah. and I will let Katie take the chat from here. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Gigi. So that was a pretty thorough overview of um, sort of why the grade level reading team uh, started this project and um, some of the ways we categorize books. but Let's chat about your libraries. How is the Beginning Reader Collection organized for you? Do you have separate designations for those early books and the transitional books? How does your leveling system work? Um, just before we launch into our own leveling system, um, we'd really like to hear from you all about how you do it, because it's always fun to see from other libraries. So we'll just take a few minutes for this. Go ahead and put your answers in the chat like you did for the last one. Oh, and I see multiple and, folks are typing. And I'll start right. off by Susan saying says, ours at DPL are JR1, JR2, and JR3, and they're color-coded yellow, blue, and red. Yes, it looks like Susan says children's staff label, our, label them ourselves from easiest into easiest and hardest. Oh, other folks have three levels. The hardest have well. the green dot. Oh, the ones in the middle have no labels, Susan says. That's interesting. This one called Middle Readers, Brian says, early is separated out. And the Middle Readers cover those beginning chapter books. Yep. Claire says yeah. that they have one, two, and three. Oh, sorry, Gigi. Oh, no, that's okay. I'm just reading. I shouldn't, I shouldn't read it aloud. I should read it to myself. It's just so interesting. Everybody has different <laughs> systems, some stickers, some not. I mean, it's not surprising that we every we all do it slightly differently. Mm -hmm. Oh, Chrissy says, easy readers have their own section, but the transitional books are not well organized. See, Danielle Yeah, Danielle, says, it is confusing. Yeah, definitely. Lou says all labeled easy readers. Gloria says we have a leveled collection. Ooh, 2 through 24. Wow. New DRA. Oh, they use the system. Yeah. DRA levels. GRL, yep. That's helpful. A chart and bookmark flyer, Claire says, that they give to patrons to help navigate. Early chapter has one, Julie says but no other separation. Phonics books are pulled out. I've seen that a couple times. Ah, yeah, Chrissy. Definitely have books that could be easy readers that are shelved somewhere else. Oh, right, and that the business about not calling them easy readers because then there's a certain stigma because they're not easy. They're not e If you're learning how to read, mm -hmm. those books are anything but easy. So that's... Separate issue. Thanks for calling that one out. Yeah, thank you, Susan. 
a certain letter sounds as you usually anything else. Yeah, it's just it's so complex. It's so um, sort of esoteric and hard to follow, I think, for us, for our customers. And we're all trying, you know, we all have the same goal, which is access, right? It's really helping everybody who wants to access these books access them, you know. And, and I think what's interesting to note is that this is sometimes like a, a bit of a fraught access situation because my kid's learning how to read and maybe they're behind or this is hard for them or I'm worried about it in one way or another or their teacher says this level and I just don't understand. So I think a lot of times our customers who are coming in with these uh, about looking for beginning readers or question, having questions about beginning readers and levels are a little bit heightened. They have a little bit like emotionally mm -hmm. heightened over this whole topic. So um, I think as much as we can help with that access, uh, mm -hmm. It's really a good thing. It's really a benefit. Yeah, yeah. early reader instead of easy. Mm -hmm. I like early readers for general. Oh, book bundles. Very nice. Rasa says. Labeled levels one, two, three, or four. Got a J it read looks like Rafa, you're talking about some criteria as well, length of sentences, gaps between sentences, level of subject covered in books mm -hmm. and graphics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure, well, there's a lot that goes yeah, into this it. Is, yeah, and it just goes to show everybody's kind of got their own system for for leveling and different things that they um, that they call them. So thank you all for sharing. Um, and if you think of something else, feel free to put it in the chat. I'm just going to advance this slide here, and then Gigi is going to cover our beginning reader collection criteria. Thanks, Katie. So we created this collection criteria, um, which you should be able to click through in the slide. Um, a grade level reading team created it in response to several needs. Um, the first one that we that you, several of us mentioned in the chat is understanding the inner, inner workings of the different levels, loving systems of multiple publishers. Spoiler alert, it's incredibly complex and inconsistent. Uh, I'm sure that's no surprise to anybody because you are here attending this presentation. The beginning reader criteria and rubric um, that we came up with are meant to be used in tandem to assist in evaluating individual beginning reader titles to determine um, inclusion in the collection at all, and if so, at what level. As I mentioned, at DPL we have three levels. We call them JR1, JR2, and JR3. I'm just going to refer to them as 1, 2, and 3 for everybody's convenience here. Um, prior to the creation of the criteria and rubric tools, at DPL uh, the publisher assigned levels were used by our collection staff to determine beginning reader collection levels. For example, if a title had been published at a assigned level of 1, it would be a JR1 in our collection. So based on our research, we've discovered that there's quite a bit of inconsistency between and within publisher assigned levels, as we can have all experienced. Each publisher has its own leveling system. Within publishers, different imprints could have different leveling systems. And then there's those charming media tie-ins that often will have even other leveling systems or appear to be pretty inappropriate for the beginning reader collection based on um, the level of difficulty, typically, of the text. So there's some fine beginning readers to look at in the slide, all at different levels. Let's move on to uh, a couple, several other uh, reasons we created this criteria. We wanted um, consistency and clarity in our leveling system for the new books and existing books. Um, the existing collection definitely needs consistent and clear leveling. That's, you know, we've all experienced that within each of our library assigned levels. There's a lot of variation. That's not necessarily a bad thing, as we'll discuss, but there are clearly books that don't belong next to other books. Um, so we have a project, that an ongoing project at DPL, to uh, level, re-level the existing collection. It's called the Beginning Reader Leveling Project. And I train staff with my uh, colleague to work on a long-term time frame to evaluate every existing title in our beginning reader collection using the criterion rubric. Um, we offered an extended version of the training that you're attending now um, with some internal stuff in May. 
that uh, Katie attended and took off with all that information in such a great way. And we formed a core team of folks who've been working on this project. So far, they've leveled about 10% of the collection. Um, and also, we know our new books need clear and consistent leveling. And our children's collection development specialist now uses these tools for every new beginning reader she buys. Um, we also wanted uh, enhanced access for staff and customers to the collection, as I said. And as we noted, they're tough to find sometimes. They're tough to sift through. And they don't, aren't of use to anybody if they're, not easy, if they're not easily accessible. So by creating our own criteria, we're attempting to provide a basic structure to support customers and staff and locating books at a helpful level for their readers. And at the same time, we do believe in intellectual freedom and the right to choose books based on interest as well as or instead of reading level. So, with that in mind, level our three reading levels, or our three beginning reader levels, one uh, intentionally encompass a range, of range within each level so that readers can be both challenged and feel a sense of mastery. So that is the story with the kind of the context for why we developed this criteria. And here are some of the nuts and bolts. Books at each level are evaluated using the following categories. Words, sentences, pagination, repetition, illustration, notes, and exception. And each exception, each category has several criteria. Um, many criteria have quantifiable factors, like a number of words per page, or number of syllables per word, pages with illustrations on them, font size, etc. Um, and also, many of the criteria require a level of informed judgment on behalf of the leveling person. So you need to evaluate if the illustrations are representative of the text, for example, or if the sentence structure is sim more simple or more complex. Uh, but the more books you review using these tools uh, and this criteria as a lens, the more comfortable you'll feel making these judgments. And we'll have some opportunities to practice using them on books later in the presentation. Um, this beginning reader collection criteria document also includes detailed instructions on using the rubric kind of in tandem with the criteria. So let's talk about that rubric. Um, first off, I want to say you can make a copy by clicking that link. You have to click on like the top line of that link, not the bottom. And when you hover over it, you get the little hand when you click on the top line. That will take you, Google will direct you to make a copy. You can use that for uh, now. You can use that while we go through stuff. You can use that for the future. You can do this later and just follow along with me here. But this is one place where you'll have access to making that copy. So this is a beginning reader collection classification rubric. It's a weighted system that's based on the criteria I told you about. And every item is scorable and weighted. And then the weights are determined by the importance to the category. And Criteria items are also scored by prevalence. And as you look at the document, you'll see it's a pretty intense document. It's got a lot going on. As you start to use it, it makes more sense. Um, and when I say prevalence in the book, what I mean is if a title fulfills a criteria 75% so, or more of the time, so most or all the time, we'll give it full points. If a title fulfills a criteria 50 75% or some of the time, we're going to subtract a point and give it one point. The title fulfills the criteria less than 50% of the time, or not at all, we're going to give it no points. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of an experiment toggling back and forth between the rubric and some books in here, book pages in here. Um, and we'll kind of see how that, that goes along. And there are Excel files, there's an Excel file as well. Um, I also want to call attention to our uh, EDI, or Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion column. We use an EDI lens for all of our work um, at DPL. And there's no point value for this column, but we really feel that it's important to call it out to denote diverse representations in a collection that's largely devoid of them so that we need to um, lift that, so that we can lift the books up. Lou says confused. Why not just use Lexile levels? Oh, such a good question. I want to address that, but I want to kind of show you how this works. Um, one of the reasons is, um, at least in DPS, uh, within each school and within each classroom, within each grade sometimes, we found that 
uh, different teachers, different grades are using different leveling systems. There's no standard um, leveling system within DPS that's required. Um, and so we, we were getting questions all over the place of all different leveling systems. And we, so we kind of needed something that was going to standardize um, things a little bit more for us. DPS is Denver Public Schools. Yes, thank you, Christine. Um, because we weren't getting that from our kids and families that were coming in. We're all over the map with the leveling system. So we wanted something that at least our staff could use um, as a tool, a standardized tool, and something that we could, you know, hopefully move towards customer education as well about using these as kind of more of a standardized thing. So yeah, Robin, is there a movement like we need diverse books around? Uh, no, not in there isn't one specifically, um, but we do hashtag need diverse beginning readers. I once wrote a guessing Geisel blog about that. If anyone wants to track that one down, but yeah, that it's a it's as, as much as we need it across other genres. We certainly need it um, in beginning readers because there's a real dearth of um, authorship as well and creatorship as well as uh, characters. So yeah, let's. Move on. We're going to jump right in to, well, I guess we should wait a couple minutes for more questions. Forgot about that part. If we have any more questions, let's chat a little bit more, and then we'll jump into some practice. We'll also hopefully have time in the end. Um, if anybody has questions, we'll, we can take time to answer those once we're done as well. I have a feeling once we start going through the uh, rubric, you'll have some questions. It's, uh, it's, it's technical. It's a little, sometimes can make your head hurt a little bit, or at least I'll see. <laughs> myself. It can make my head hurt a little bit. Um, I am not a huge math or spreadsheet person, but it's a very useful tool. Yes. Oh, Ellen, that's Fine. a great Please question. Um, yes. Thank you. Yes. Take There's a section in the, in the rubric for that as well. See a couple more folks typing. We have a section of readers that includes fiction and nonfiction. Do you have a separate section? Um, our beginning readers are, um, they're all fiction. No, I'm doubting myself, but yes, they, yes. The no, true, nonfiction, yeah, the nonfiction is just all juvenile nonfiction. Um, that's all in one section. But they do have the early or transitional subject headings in their records. So, for example, you could mm -hmm. type, you know, early books and sharks, and then you're going to come up with the, hopefully going to come up with the right nonfiction book um, for that reader to consider books with speech bubbles and non-standard format. We don't right now, and that's interesting to consider, Gina. I make a note of that to take that back to our team. Um, we just kind of go along I with it if it's filed in our beginning reader section and don't consider it like a graphic novel um, unless it's cataloged as such. But really interesting point. What were you going to say, Katie? Um, I was going to say I actually have noted that in, when I've been reviewing books for this, um, like sometimes those speech bubbles can be an impediment, but sometimes they can actually be helpful to the reader. Um, so there's a little bit of informed judgment on that, at least that's how I've been considering it. Mm, good point. Got Claire, do your collection, librarians, folks who purchase books use this? Yeah, I think Gigi said that the collection mm -hmm. librarian is going to start using this guide from now on, right? Yes, she's actually been using it um, for about nine months now, maybe oh, close to a year since we developed um, and kind of finalized uh, these, the rubric. Um, she just runs every book that she purchases through the rubric now um, in order to level it. And yeah. Katie, this All is right. Christine. Just to FYI, yeah. um, the pod is ready for you to share your screen when you are ready. You can just use a little yeah, drop there. Yeah, I should dive into that. All right. Yes. Let's go ahead. All right. Perfect. Can everyone see my screen okay? 
This is new for me, so you should see a Today I Will Fly by Mo Willens. All right. So we are going to go ahead and try out our rubric with one of our level one books. Um, this is Today I Will Fly by Mo Willems. It's the first book in the Elephant and Piggy series. Um, it's also a Geisel Award winning series. So um, just a reminder, you can watch me do this or you're totally welcome to follow along on your own copy of the spreadsheet. And um, Christine has put a link to that in the chat. Um, and, you know, you're welcome to kind of toggle back and forth with that document. Okay, so again, due to copyright issues, we um, want to acknowledge that we are only going to share scans of a few pages of each book during this educational exercise um, because we don't want to violate copyright rules. So just go ahead and show you here is the first thing that the reader will see, really big font, Today I Will Fly. And then we've got, you can see it right off the bat, we've got very little text, vibrant illustrations. We do have those speech bubbles, which we may have to reevaluate um, based on the comment that was made earlier. But, you know, max of one sentence per page or page spread, pretty big font, Piggy being all silly down there, repetition. All right, so I'm just going to go back up here. And now I will show you the rubric. Like Gigi said, it's a, it gets a little technical, and we have our different categories for our words, our sentences. We've got repetition, whether there is any illustrations, and then additional criteria, which is where we address um, the EDI aspect as well as font legibility. Um, if there's something else that you know feels kind of off and takes away from that reading experience, this is a good column for that. So you'll have plenty of time to hopefully to get familiar with this um, as we go through these exercises and as you do them on your own. But the first thing that we do is we put in the title, which I have already done, Today I Will Fly, and then the author, and then the level, which is level one, or for us, JR1. And then if I were doing this, um, not on a presentation, I would put in the publisher and the publisher's level, just because that's an interesting way to see, does this match the publisher level, does it not? All right, so let's go ahead and look at the words. So let's see, mostly single syllable words. We've got today, but otherwise I will fly. You will not fly today. Tomorrow is multi-syllable, but otherwise these are all single syllable. Single syllables here. Never is two, but otherwise single. And then we've got a bunch of single syllables here. So based on these uh, sheets, which again, I know it's not the whole book. Um, so as Gigi said, um, two is all or almost all of the time. And so just the occasional uh, double or, you know, triple syllable word, I am going to put a two there because, you know, it's definitely more than half the time. So I don't feel like it deserves a one. Uh, familiar high frequency words, I would say yes. Opportunity to blend, to lie, that's a good way to blend sounds. And there's a few more words like that in here. I'm going to give that a two as well. Now, if we go to structure, again, that's something that you can notice right off the bat. It's simple, so I will put it two. Definitely saw plenty of exclamation points in there. They were very excited about it. There were at least 
two, there are at least two to eight words per sentence. I'm going to put a two there. There's at least one sentence per page, and I did not see any that were more than one or two per page spread. So we're going to put two for that. And then one to two lines per page. Yep. Supportive line break. That works pretty well. All right, so let's go to repetition. Word and sentence structure repeated often. So if we look here, we see a lot of, you will not fly today. You will not fly tomorrow. You will not fly next week. So there's a good amount of repetition there. And then this aspect of flying is repeated quite a bit. So I'm going to put that as a two. OK, so let's move to illustrations. As we saw, there were illustrations on every page. There were illustrations that represented the text. And then, let's see. I guess they didn't take up more than half the page. There's a good bit of white space, so maybe I would put that as a one, right? OK. Now, additional criteria. Plot and storyline are simple. Pig wants to fly. Elephant says pig can't fly. That sounds pretty simple to me. Um, there, is, there is dialogue, technically speaking. Um, there is appropriate use of speech bubbles, so I'm going to put that as a two. Um, there's plenty of white space around, so we'll do, do two for that as well. And then font, 14 plus points, and legibility. That is definitely pretty large font, so I'm going to put that as a two. So EDI, uh, hard to tell how diverse, you know, elephants and piggies are, so I'm going to put no for that. And I didn't find anything that really took away from the experience for me. So here is my total score, 11.5. So I think normally if a book is a 9 or above, or a 9.5 or above, I would say that we keep it in the current level. So at the end, we make our recommendation. As you can see, there's a few different options. So if this were too hard, I might say move to level two, or if it's really hard, level three. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and just say we're going to keep it in the current level. And that is an example of reviewing a level one book. Thank you, Katie. I'm just going to wait for the pod to reset, and I'm going to my screen here, and I'm going to jump over now to, sorry, y'all, I got so excited about what Katie was sharing that I didn't get to the right page of our presentation. So I'm going to talk about uh, Frog and Toad, our friend, and we're going to go through that. So this is, we're going up now in difficulty to something that's considered a level two, a JR2 by, by DPL. And, um, we chose these familiar books because of the copyright issue, and we know that we can't have all the pages, and we hope that most of us are familiar with um, these books. So jumping right into Frog and Toad. And you can see that the uh, number of words on the page has increased fairly significantly. There appear to be chapters now. Um, more different kinds of punctuation, longer sentences. So I just kind of like to always scan the book a little bit um, at the beginning of this process. And you know, clearly, I obviously, I'd scan the whole book uh, if I had it. And then I go back to the beginning and jump into the rubric, like Katie did. So I'm going to go to level two, Frog and Toad are friends, enter in the information here. And publisher also calls this a level two. So now the criteria has uh, changed. And I just want to point out before I start that I have this document here, uh, which I shared with you, uh, which is the 
beginning reader collection criteria. And it's going to kind of break down everything, each of these criteria items that are uh, placed in the rubric. So you can view them here as well. And then you also have a breakdown at the end of this document of uh, all this process that we're discussing here. Scoring titles, um, using the, the exceptions column, the weighted score, and all of that. So single syllable, so we're going to the words item, the words column and looking at this first item. Single syllable words and frequent incorporation of double syllable words. Uh, let's take a look. Seeing mostly single syllable words, there's a double meadow. Buttons, jacket, the river, so we're getting a nice incorporation. Button and meadow again. Uh, let's see, pocket, sparrow, so raccoon. So to me, this is frequent incorporation. I'm going to give that a two. And I know that everybody does this a little differently because I've talked with colleagues who um, I uh, use this in different ways. Some folks just read the book, and as items uh, jump out at them, they jump around the rubric. I just kind of have that linear way of thinking, so for me it's easier to go item by item. Um, as you use this, you'll find what system works best for you. Going back to the uh, book, looking for mostly familiar but occasionally challenging words. So, you know, maybe a word like meadow or we've not seen the word button, sparrow, so mostly familiar, occasionally challenging, raccoon, square, that's got a cue. So I'm going to give that, that looks to me like that gets a full, full point, too, and then you can see that um, that book gets full points for the words category. Moving on to sentences. We're going to go back and look at sentence structure, simple still, but occasionally more complex sentences. When I was looking at this book before, I was like, oh, Arnold Lobel, some of these sentences are kind of complex. Yes, yes, yes. Like this one here at the end. He jumped up and down and screamed, the whole world is covered with buttons and not one of them is mine. But a lot of the sentences are quite simple, so it's kind of a nice mixture. Again, I'd call it occasional, and I'm going to put that as full points. And also, looking at the punctuation in the interest of time, I'm not going to go back and forth, but yes, the punctuation had all of that stuff in there. Um, when I was looking at this book before, these items, uh, there are a fair amount of pretty wordy sentences, a fair amount of long sentences and a fair amount of pages that have uh, that go above all of these criteria. So I decided I'm going to give each of these a one. And uh, I think this last one I'm going to give a two about most of the time. No, I'm going to give this one a one. So you can see it's lowered the score in the sum product. It's not getting full marks. It's getting a, a 1.2 instead of a two. Um, so we're just going to go on and see. I know tons of new, uh, tons of words are repeated in Frog and Toad. Uh, new and challenging words like button, maybe, or meadow. He repeats each word. The sparrow flew down. Excuse me, said the sparrow. I'm going to give that a two. That column gets full marks. Moving on to illustrations. They are on every page, for sure. Representative text, especially when new or unfamiliar words are introduced, absolutely. If they introduce the word sparrow, there's a picture of a sparrow, there's a picture of a meadow, there's a picture of the raccoon and the button and the different shaped buttons. So I'm going to give that a two. Uh, the plot is still simple, but getting more expansive. Certainly, um, you know, they wander all over the place looking for that lost button, and in the end. Where was that button? It's on the floor the whole time. So we're going to give that to the font size. If I take a look at it, um, and you can find resources online that you can print out that will help you measure font size as well. Um, I'm going to say, yeah, give that two full points. And definitely it's a legible font. It's not um, a fancy, funky font that's going to make uh, it really hard on new readers. No diversity in frog and toad. They are a frog and a toad. Um, the exceptions column I just want to mention, um, should have a two in here. 
Um, it, the way that it works is if something gets your spidey sense tingling, it's not on the rubric, but it's still, it just like sometimes it's those media tie-ins, sometimes it's just something that seems like it's taking away from that successful reading experience for a develop, developing reader, and again, this is where your informed judgment comes in you're going to subtract points. This is the only column where you subtract points. So let's say I'd say, you know what, I just, I really thought that that, um, you know, some of the lines were spaced oddly or something like that. I'm going to, and you can see that subtracts. So we'll put that back to full marks and you can experiment around with this. The formula should be pretty good. So uh, Frog and Toad gets an 11.2. It's not a perfect score, um, but it's still uh, above nine. So I'll say I reviewed this. And I'm going to also recommend that this is kept in the current level. All right. So I think, Christine, that we need to skip that third book uh, because we are running low on time here. Um, so Katie, if you want to jump into um, our mystery book, I think that that yes. is... Uh, that is the move. Just to say that third book is a wonderful, wonderful level three reader called Meet Yasmin. I wanted to share it with you in case you aren't familiar with it um, because it's a great example yeah, of um, a really excellent quality level three reader that hits all of the um, criteria items and also is uh, diverse and an own voices book. It's written by a person who shares the cultural background uh, with the characters. So let's yes, move on to excellent. that mystery book. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Katie. Yes, so quick scroll through, Yasmin. All right, so uh, this is one of those uh, examples of a book with a media tie-in that I found is more inconsistently leveled than others. This is part of the Briar Stablemates collection. Um, they have a, a line of their own little plastic horses. So this one is called Diamond, um, and this is one that we're probably going to have to re-level. So we see that it's got chapters. So right away, that's a pretty big red flag that this is going to be more advanced. And unlike Frog and Toad, where the lines were sort of um, structured more simply, this one has full paragraphs. And you can see that they're definitely more advanced, like big gelding, definitely have to have more context for that. Um, this is a pretty big wall of text here as well. So it may surprise you to learn that this was initially a level two. And if we go through, I'm not going to go through the whole rubric, but just sort of right off the bat, you can see that it's, I would say, mostly more complex words, definitely a lot of challenging words. Like I said, bay gelding is pretty, uh, pretty advanced. I didn't know what that was. Um, and then all of these where, you know, it's three to 12 words per sentence, two to four sentences per page, that's definitely a lot, right? Um, so again, I'm not going to go through all of the details, but it's pretty clear that this book would fit more, um, would fit better in a JR3 book, right? So let me see here. All right, give me one second. Having a little technical difficulties. I do want to show you the JR3 criteria. And I can do it too, Katie. If you want to there we go. Okay. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Sorry about that, everybody. So here's the JR, or the level three criteria, right? So this fits a little bit better. Um, 
eight or more lines per page. Yeah, for the most part, that's true. Four to eight sentences per page. Um, you can see that the there's not really any attempt to repeat sentence structure here. It reads very much like, you know, a book with chapters, right? So the sentences do vary. Um, not a lot of word repetition. Definitely uh, larger controlled vocabulary, right? So for all of those reasons, I would definitely feel more comfortable uh, moving this into level three. And I, I did actually level this one, and it uh, ticked way more of the boxes for um, the JR3 or level three um, category. So, and I had recommended that this be moved to level three. So that is just a good example of the inconsistencies of publisher leveling systems. And as many people mentioned, how you know they can differ, and it's important to evaluate them. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, I mean, that is one where you would be going through a nice pile and leveling and be like, oh, mm -hmm, that definitely needs uh, benefits from uh, being run through a tool like this, or having a tool like this available. So, you know, we're providing you with copies of these. Please um, use that criteria that has the instructions on how to level, uh, to how to use the rubric and use that rubric and start working on your collection and kind of see where things fall. Um, these tools are, we made them and shared them because we want you to take them with you um, after this presentation is done. Yeah, so I know we're at 1 o'clock, but we'll leave a little time for questions. And this is Christina. I'm going to jump in just really quickly um, as people are typing in questions. I'm going to um, put another link to the CSL in Session website. That's where you can access the archive in case you have to run now and you want to hear um, the questions that were asked and how they were addressed. You can come back and revisit it. Um, the slides, uh, which are available here, are also posted on the CSL in Session website along with an, um, both the uh, Google Sheets copy of the rubric, so you can make your own copy and use it moving forward, and an Excel copy. Um, and um, all of their slides, once again, have access to um, all of the information that they shared, plus a whole host of other resources, so you'll have access to that. I'm also going to pop in a survey um, link, because we would love to know what you thought of today's session. So I'm now going to be quiet, and I'm going to pop those links in there for you guys to access, but feel free to continue asking questions. Thanks, Christine. So you recommend a level change, but what happens to them? Uh, our particular process is that we, all the ones that are recommended for change go into record sets. Our record sets go to our technical access services uh, department for processing. They're going to call in, and we haven't actually gotten to that, the point yet where they're starting to call in all the copies of each of the uh, titles that's been recommended for re-leveling. Um, so then they'll call them in and uh, work on them. Uh, and send them back out into the world. That's our plan. Anyway. Like we have a, we have a couple more questions coming in. Meanwhile, I'll just remind you. There's, as Christine said, there's multiple ways to access these resources, and this is one of them within this uh, presentation. And then just calling your attention to some sources and further reading. Um, both ones we used in the presentation, some great articles to keep you thinking uh, even more about beginning reader levels and leveling systems. So do dig into those. JR1, 2, and 3 don't correspond to grade level, right? Just the levels of difficulty, correct, Audrey? Anything? Time invested will pay off in improving access. I mean, that's such a great question, Chrissy, since we haven't, um, you know, completed a full cycle of this process or this, you know, kind of an audit. Um, I can't tell you what the return on investment is, but we do think that um, accessing these books is convoluted enough for staff and uh, customers that it's worth investing some resources on it. Something else to note is that it's a long-term project for us. We're not saying, okay, DPL staff, 
uh, or children's staff or the, or the team, you know, drop everything and do this. This is a really great ongoing long-term project for folks to get some work from home work in uh, for those that uh, need that. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, kind of, it's an ongoing long-term project. It certainly isn't a system-wide priority, but uh, within our grade level of reading team uh, work, uh, it's something that we are uh, moving forward with. Shelved separately and by Elizabeth, level. The, they are all shelved separately by level. So we have them all color-coded, and then they're all shelved um, by the author's last name within their level, or, you know, the first few letters of the author's last name. So if anybody wants to reach out to us, I know that, like Katie said, this uh, is all kind of technical and can be tricky and a little bit confusing. So please reach out to either of us by email, um, and we can help you troubleshoot uh, the document. If you find anything weird or wonky with the document, let me know. It's my baby. I've been working on it for a long time and uh, updating it and cha making changes. So let me know if anything does not seem to work properly, and we'll uh, get that for you too. And that is all I have. Did you have anything else, Katie? No, I think uh, I think that was it. Thank you all for coming. Uh, looks like Christine said if anyone needs a certificate for attending, shoot her an email. Yeah, you should be so. able to, any link that I put in the chat should be clickable, so you can um, uh, just uh, shoot me an email and I'm happy to get you uh, a certificate for today's session. Um, once again, everything will be on the CSL in Session website, the slides, the archive, um, the rubric in a variety of formats. Um, the archive should be ready probably in the next hour or so. And I just want to really thank Gigi and Katie for um, kind of bringing us into their world at Denver Public and sharing the rubric that they've been working on and sort of how they're doing all of this and kind of giving everybody a demo. Um, so thank you to Katie and Gigi for um, doing the CSL in session with us. Oh, thanks for the awesome opportunity, Christine. And thanks to everybody for sitting with us and spending this uh, lunch hour with us and this information. I hope it yeah. uh, was useful to you. Really appreciate it. Oh, and Christine, can we get that criteria available in the archives too? That yes. document as well? Thank you. Yes. Is that listed in your... Um, on the, on the resources slide? Yes, ma'am. OK. Yes, I will do that. I'll make a note of that right now. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Danielle. I'm glad it was helpful. It's thank like you, a Christine. real laser-focused one. It's like a, it's not a broad one. It's real kind of lasering in on this very particular topic. Oh, thanks, Susan. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Ellen. Um, lots to think about for us as well, and I appreciate um, the comments as well. We've gotten some interesting uh, thoughts to take back to the team and discuss. Mm -hmm. Well, I think with that, I will um, wish all of our attendees and Judy and Katie a great afternoon. So thanks, everybody, for attending. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for hosting. Thank you, thanks. everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.